Now that summer's here, no one really wants to think about school starting again next fall. However, Governor Dayton recently signed the E-12 Education Finance Bill, which spends almost $19 billion over the next two years. Joining me in the studio to talk about the bill is Chairwoman of the E-12 Finance Committee, Senator Carla Nelson. Welcome. Great to be here, Shannon. You've been very generous with your time over session. You visited me and talked about education policy. Here you are again yes. with the education bill signed into law. What are you most excited about? Well, one, that we have a very robust uh, education bill. Number one, we put 2% increase on the formula each year of the biennium, of the upcoming biennium, that's 6% total increase on the per pupil formula. That's what our school districts asked for. That's what teachers needed. That's what uh, students need. It's the most flexible of funding. It treats all students fairly and it goes right to the classroom where our students are. So, and that's a costly item. Mm -hmm. That was about $371 million just to increase that. But I'm very glad about that. I'm also very glad that we really focused on our earliest learners, those four-year-olds, making sure they're ready for kindergarten when they get there. And we did it in a very uh, broad way, which provides the greatest flexibility for parents uh, and also uh, the private market. We have a private market that's serving four-year-olds now, and it also supports our school-based uh, four-year-old model as well. In fact, this is called the Minnesota Early Learning Model, where we uh, target scholarships to those kids most at need um, and for flexible use in a mixed delivery system. It's called the Minnesota Early Learning Model, and it's being uh, touted all over the nation uh, for its success. And I'm glad that we were able to build upon that model and invest in our earliest learners this year as well. And so that model then, some money is going for scholarships, some money is going to a program called School Readiness Plus, some money is going for Governor Dayton's uh, pre-kindergarten. Voluntary pre-K. Voluntary yep. pre-K. And some money is going to Head Start. So there's a variety of streams to meet those students wherever they yes, are, are needed. Yes, and, and, and every four-year-old's need is not the same. Neither is every community's need the same. So we have this mixed delivery model depending upon an individual student's need and, of course, the communities, what type of resources they have. And so we have invested very wisely uh, in that, and we do know how important it is that kids are ready for, four year, for kindergarten when they get there. Absolutely. Uh, one provision that maybe caused a little bit of controversy were changes to LIFO, which has been that last in, first out when school districts have to make cut, cutbacks to staff. The newer teachers have been let go before the veteran teachers. Why do you support this change? Well, what we have uh, in the education bill, which the governor signed and also supported, is what's called the LIFO light. In other words, it's a very common sense, slimmed down version of something that uh, Senator Terry Bonoff carried a couple of years ago. Uh, our current state law says that if a school district and its union representation do not come to agreement on what to do with um, non-voluntary teacher layoffs, then the automatic fallback is this LIFO position. So the last teacher who signed the contract for the school district is the first one to leave. Uh, people have realized how difficult that is for many reasons. Mm -hmm. It doesn't give school districts the flexibility to determine what to do in those difficult situations and what will be best for students. I'm from a school district where at one point we were needing to lay off teachers and it got down to not just the date that the teacher signed the contract, but the time of day that the contract was signed. That is not the best way to determine uh, which teachers are best going to fill the needs of our students. So uh, the version that is passed now just simply states it really empowers school districts and their union representations. So uh, if they, they just have to come to an agreement, whatever that agreement is and how best to lay off teachers if that is needed, uh, that's an agreement they need to make. So it empowers both. It empowers local educators. And it's a negotiation then between yes. the, the district and the union. Yes. And the reason it's so important is because one, teachers are the most critical in-school variable that we control. A teacher uh, is the one critical value in determining a student's success. And then secondly, um, all parents uh, realize they want whatever teacher is going to be the best for them, uh, in, for their student uh, in the classroom. And then, you know, we have a severe teacher shortage. And I, can, you can imagine the high cost 
of a four-year degree or even a five-year uh, teaching degree and then for these young teachers to get in a district only to be the first one let go and then they start in a new district and they're the first one let go and we're finding uh, students are just not willing to invest significant sums of money and their educational time in for a situation in which they're not retained based upon the work they do. So we were kind of pitting our most veteran teachers against our newest teachers, and we don't need to do that. What we did do with the LIFO light provision is we gave flexibility and local control to the local school districts and the union representation to figure out what's gonna be best for those districts. Well, let's turn to some new programs, some new things that are that are part of this bill. One of them is the Rural Career and Technical Education Consortium, which is a mouthful, sure. yes. abbreviated CTE. But can you explain how this will work? Sure. It's a public-private partnership aimed at really filling the need, the growing need we see for uh, workforce in career and tech ed. Not necessarily a four-year college degree for every student, but what we're finding is we need a lot of uh, skilled labor, a lot of career and tech ed labor, and so this really gets to that in targeted areas in different quadrants of the state. So these public-private partnerships working together to provide uh, education, a high school education that provides career and technical education as well as high school credits. We have an example in Rochester um, that is called CTEC, which is just remarkable in that students are getting training from chefs. Uh, there's a veterinary science uh, lab there. Uh, there's a whole mechanics lab and an industrial lab. And so the students are getting trained from professionals uh, in the field as well as their high school teachers. And they come out both with their high school credits as well as the career tech ed uh, credentials. And we're looking for stackable credentials. Uh, we want to get more of our students trained for the jobs that exist. And so then these are programs that are not necessarily for the college bound student, but, but for people who, when they finish, high school, just want to get to work and get to work in a, in a good job. Some, some yeah. are for kids just like that and mm -hmm. some are for um, college bound kids. Okay. So it's a very broad spectrum, but again, we are expanding educational opportunities for our high school students. Does this mean that students are maybe having to make career choices even sooner than they used to have to do? Oh, that's a good question, Shannon. Uh, it's hard to tell. Uh, certainly there are more opportunities and there are more paths to follow. So uh, perhaps students would feel they need to make those decisions earlier, although I don't think that's the intent. I think the intent is to make sure that every student is getting the education they need to prepare them for the jobs that exist tomorrow that they could fill. Well, and then they're also not going into huge debt, which is which is a big plus. <laughs> oh, yeah, Minnesota has the fourth or fifth highest student debt levels in the nation. Mm -hmm. So this is a great fit for many kids and it's really great for our workforce as well. Let's talk for a moment about agriculture educator grants. Who will receive these and how does that work? Uh, well, if you think about it, um, our ag educators are not always teaching with students when agriculture is its most active. And so the agriculture educator grants allow school districts to apply for that extra grant money so that students can actually be in class with their instructor when the crops are really growing in the field. So it's really that just-in-time learning. It's being there when it's happening and making sure that we have our instructors there. So the real world experience versus the classroom experience. Right, which does not necessarily occur. Most of our right. agricultural growth and productivity uh, does not occur from uh, September to May. Uh, the agriculture season is really in the summertime and we want to make sure our students are able to participate in that with their teachers. One more thing I'd like to talk about. Uh, you, I believe it was your bill, um, to provide educational stability for kids in foster care so that they can stay in their home school while they're experiencing other instability in their life. Yes. What was the real impetus for this? Well, of course, my experience uh, in the Rochester Public Schools, and I was a Title I teacher, and uh, we would see kids who were already experiencing stress because they're in a foster home. Something's happened to their uh, mother or father, and they're in a foster home. And then when something happens in the middle of the school year and that student needs to go to a new foster home, um, how difficult it was to see a student uh, uprooted from maybe the one stability piece in their life, which was their, their classroom, where they had already uh, been part of a classroom, uh, and then to get uprooted in the middle of the school year is just another stress at a very stressful time for kids. And so 
uh, the Olmstead County uh, Public Service and the Rochester Public Schools were willing to work on a program to look at how can we best help these students maintain the most stability they can in these stressful times. And this is a pilot program. It's a grant. I'm hoping, I know Olmstead County will apply, others may as well. But again, it's really uh, trying to align our resources to really give kids stability in these very stressful times. Senator Nelson, there's so much good stuff in this bill, and I want to thank you for your time today. Great. And when very quickly, we have much more to talk about. It's a great bill, You can Shannon. come back. All right. Thank you.